So uh, if everybody is ready, we'll get started here. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is David Lesher. I'm the Director of Government Affairs at PPIC, the Public Policy Institute of California. Um, and I'm sure um, most of you or all of you are familiar with PPIC, but we are a, a research uh, institute, a nonprofit, independent uh, think tank uh, based here in Sacramento, or based in San Francisco, I'm sorry, with offices here in Sacramento. Um, and we do uh, research on most of the topics that cross the plate here in Sacramento, and in addition to the statewide survey that we're going to talk about today. Um, and a lot of you may be familiar with the format. We're going to do it a little differently today. You know, instead of slides, we're going to have a conversation uh, between Mark Baldessari, the, the CEO and president of PPIC, and the director of the statewide survey, uh, and uh, John Myers, the and senior. The comedy, yeah political editor at uh, KQED Radio. So um, there's a lot to talk about in this poll. As you, If you've been looking at the news coverage today, there's a lot of different topics in it. So there's a lot to, lot to get to in a conversation. Uh, I'm gonna, I got a couple quick announcements before I turn it over to them. Um, first of all, this is being live broadcast. So there's an audience not just here in the room, but also out in internet land. And uh, if you don't want to get m embarrass yourself, you might turn off your cell phone or silence your cell phone. And, um, and another announcement, I was going to welcome Donna Lucas, who's the chair of the board at PPIC. Welcome, Donna. <laughs> um, uh, also, we have uh, another event coming up next week in this same room on June 11th. Uh, we will have an event uh, about a new report coming out from PPIC Bren Fellow Hans Johnson about online education in uh, higher education. Um, so the poll, you sh on your chair, you should have a, a copy of the survey that we're going to talk about today and also an evaluation form, uh, that little salmon colored sheet. And if you wanted to fill that out uh, at the end of the, the event and drop it off on the table on your way out and tell us how you think we did, that would be very much appreciated. Um, and one last thing. Uh, this, is, uh, this event is part of the James Irvine Foundation briefing series. Uh, they, they help us help support the lunch briefing series that we do uh, about a lot of the work, uh, research work on a variety of topics. And so a thank you to the James Irvine Foundation. So with that, um, I will turn it over to John Myers to lead a discussion. Uh -oh. um, and <laughs> please welcome John Myers and Mark Polisari. I confess, I feel very strange being up here at this point because, like, I, I kind of—I have two young children, I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. I kind of feel like um, I've got the kids' menu and the crayons, <laughs> and the adults are over here. So I'm going to defer to Mark on all the all the smart stuff, and then, like a good reporter, I'll throw spitballs or ask him questions on it. Um, so everybody's been digging into the poll, thanks to to um, to. Um, to PPIC both for having the poll and having me be here, but really for the poll because I think it gives us a great snapshot and stuff. And I'm always mindful that people understand polls the right way. And I think this is kind of like me as a reporter because so many of us in, in the news media need to do a good job at reminding people that it's a snapshot in time. It's a singular moment that you were able to take the temperature of Californians. It's not necessarily going to apply to everything else, but what the hell, I'll make it apply to everything else. Um, well, I mean, maybe we can start off by talking about what, what um, we can go through some of the topics here, but as you conducted the poll and came back, what were the big takeaways, the big pictures out of this and how Californians feel about their government right now? Thanks. Thank you, John. And first of all, I want to thank John for being here today. Um, this program was, uh, was a late addition. We were supposed to be having a program that was uh, in which our associate survey director Dean Bonner would be here giving a PowerPoint slides and so forth. But um, when just when the survey was coming out of the field, his wife was uh, was in delivery for a baby. And so they had a baby last week. And um, so then we scrambled and, and uh, decided <laughs> that I should be here <laughs> today. You yeah. got the smart one and you got the kids' <laughs> table over here. I, I uh, was supposed to be in Fresno for a water event we were having today and said, no, I'm going to come here. and. And I said, we're going to do something a little different. Um, John is always really interesting to talk to, but we never have enough time to talk on the phone. Everything's always <laughs> real rushed, you know, in real time. And so this would give us an opportunity to um, 
to present the survey results in a different way. So thanks to all of you for being here. And, and Dean and Laura and Joaquin, if you're watching, how are you doing? And um, I'll, I'll do what I can here. Something for you. tells me they're not, Mark. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think you're right. Um, this was, uh, in a lot of ways, a r very uh, remarkable uh, poll for us. The first one in which we found, and we've, uh, we've been conducting surveys in, since April 1998, um, seven or eight times a year on average, that uh, water and the drought was the top issue uh, facing the state. Um, we've been seeing that number inching up, but it, it, took, uh, it took another leap uh, between our March poll and our May poll, uh, because of course right in between that, uh, the governor announced uh, that we were going to have you know, the first um, uh, statewide mandatory reductions in water. And um, lots of concern around not just what's going on statewide, but in every region of the state, um, we saw, again, a record high number of Californians saying that in their part of the state, um, uh, water, the supply of water was a big problem. So um, those were the big takeaways. The surprise for me, which I, I mentioned to you when we, we spoke yesterday, was that we had a question about the mandatory um, reductions. Uh, were they too much about right or not enough? Most people said it, they were about right. But there were three times as many people who said um, not enough as to uh, too much. And that, that was a surprise to me. But you're correct um, in pointing out that this is a snapshot in time. And those questions are really designed as, um, to track things, particularly that last question, because it's all hypothetical to Californians right now, right? Um, everybody's just trying to figure out what what this drought means for them and for their locality and what they're going to be asked to do. To do. Um, our survey team, before we went into the field, we actually had another question in the survey which we wanted to ask. I don't usually get to talk to you about pretests, but we, we ended up not asking it. And, but this is telling in itself, we will be asking it. Um, and it was about the specific reductions that you're being asked to do. You know, how do you feel about this? And we had such a high rate of don't knows before we started the survey. You know, we usually interview about 10 to 20 people that we didn't ask at this time. So that in itself is kind of telling where, where we are now and how things might change over time. How it'll evolve, I guess. I, I, I was really fascinated. Um, again, the snapshot thing is always foremost in my mind about what we take out of a poll. But I thought it was really interesting when you look back at your May 2014 to your May 2015 number. And if you've looked at this, the May 2014 number had jobs in the economy, number one, water, number two. The numbers are almost perfectly reversed in May 2015, yes. where water is about the same number. Now 39% is the most important issue. Jobs economy second. It has really sunk in yeah. in, in, in lots of ways. Um, it, it sunk in, and, and we, we can't make the uh, assumption that it's because, oh, the economy is so great that it's, it's fallen down. I mean, and, and you're, if you haven't seen John's column from this morning, you should. Because, um, you know, the ratings of the economy are pretty so-so. You know, they're pretty mediocre right now. Um, yeah, we, we have a stronger economy than we did a few years ago, but a lot of people uh, are not convinced that this is, you know, the next big boom, and, or they're not experiencing it in their own lives. So uh, it's, it's all about the water piece uh, more than it's about the economy's changed that much in the last 12 months. I was called an official pessimist on the radio this morning. I did an interview with KPCC, our um, public radio friends in Los Angeles, Sherry Jeffy, who we oh, know okay. is a great. She said, I think you're a glass half empty pessimist. Anyway, because I had written this piece that said that, that again, just the reporter, yeah. that, that gloominess of Californians yeah. seems to be persistent even in the face of, and that's another part of this poll, even in the face of a lot of um, snippets of better information about the state. I mean, we had you know, almost 30,000 jobs reported in April, new jobs, the job numbers keep ticking up. Um, some parts of the state still struggling very much, understandably so, but that number of uh, right direction, wrong direction is very persistent of yeah. people frustrated and worried about the, the coming months as yeah. good times, bad times. Yeah, and, and the, the drought, um, has given people something else to worry about. Um, it, uh, almost in, in any category of, uh, of, of employment or, or work or activity, there's some, as we head into this summer, people are thinking, you know, well, how is that going to affect my summer plans? Or, 
you know, how is it going to affect um, my lawn? How is it going to affect um, the economy in general in California? There's, you know, I think that there's, that there's just uh, something else to worry about now. It's, if I can just jump on the, the um, right direction, wrong direction stuff for a moment. This is a bit of a pivot. I mean, as all of you know, when you look at a poll, there's so many things in it. It's like that buffet back there. You could just, we could eat the, the salad the whole time, but we could move it to another item. But um, the, the uh, right direction, wrong direction, and, and optimism mm -hmm. uh, somewhat stands at odds to me as a reporter with the governor's job approval rating and some of the ideas they like about his budget right. and you know those kinds of things. It doesn't translate, or perhaps in some way, me as a reporter and observer of, of what happens here, I've always thought that the governor has a pretty good barometer of where Californians are, and that probably uh, aids him in trying to restrain what maybe the legislature wants to spend and do, in some ways it's reflective there. They, they, it's not like they like what he's doing, but they don't exactly feel good about everything else. It's true. And, and think about how the governor has sort of messaged this, um, this, this time period we are in, in terms of the budget. You know, he's basically said, you know, we may be in a bubble right now. Um, the money, the surplus funds that we're seeing right now we can't assume that we're going to have those kinds of funds for the next few years. So in a sense, the governor has um, uh, his sense of where we are, where the economy is going, and, and where right direction, wrong direction is. Uh, you know, very modest expectations, um, some cautions about where we are right now and how we should plan. And um, the, the public likes. Uh, what, how he's doing overall, particularly around fiscal issues. And um, their perception of how the state is going is pretty consistent with the way he's viewing things. You know, he's maybe more of a, a booster about the economy and our long range uh, projections um, for, for where California is going. But he's certainly not out there saying, oh, this, these are terrific times and, you know, we should, we should uh, be exuberant about them. I want to ask you about some of the tax um, items in, in the poll. So um, uh, you asked uh, five different questions about tax questions, as I can see it. One, extending Prop 30, the temporary taxes that are gradually starting to expire, um, income taxes on the most wealthy, sales taxes on everyone, uh, changing Prop 13, cigarette taxes, oil tax, extending sales taxes to services. Um, so. One of the things that we often notice um, is that early polling before political campaigns begins uh, is a great measurement of like uh, the viability in some ways of what a measure or a proposal will be. And you have to start high because once a no campaign kicks in, numbers tend to fall a lot. And the one that's the most interesting out of that to me is the cigarette tax. Yeah. It's at 70% support of all adults, 67% of likely voters in your poll. But we know the last time a cigarette tax was on the ballot, it was a, a razor thin yeah. defeat. Mm -hmm. uh, that started high and went low. Yeah. And so the rest of these measures are pretty middling yeah. at best here. The extension of Prop 30, the uh, split roll Prop 13 number, the oil tax. I mean, those are all mm -hmm. not exactly rah-rah uh, levels of numbers this far out from an election, it could get worse unless somebody made a real yeah. effort. Yeah, and, and that's my read also, that these, these are not strong numbers for um, uh, an, an odd year um, going into um, an election year next year in a time when people are, are thinking about what they might want to, uh, they might want to see in the ballot. And so we, we asked our very, generic tracking questions about uh, several taxes that may find their way to the ballot through the initiative process. And um, we felt, uh, in each case, these are not, these are not strong numbers. Uh, the context for this, of course, is, uh, and some of those numbers have actually dropped over time. Mm -hmm. For instance, the property, uh, the, the split roll property tax. Um, you know, we've come out of a period, um, particularly before the November 2012 election, in which people were really concerned about the fiscal well-being and health of the state. Um, and there, were, there was a period of time between 2010 and 2012, roughly, in which there was, you know, there was some willingness to think about what we might need 
um, to raise the sales tax, or we might need to raise the income tax. And today, those feelings are not as, um, uh, there's not a sense of urgency about that. And whenever you talk about raising taxes in California, you have to come back to those questions on the trust in government uh, page that we had, the 60% of people who say that, um, uh, you know, uh, state government can do what's right only some of the time, the more than half the people who say um, state government uh, wastes a lot of the money we pay in taxes. So you've, you've always got that pressure down on, you know, people's willingness to, to raise taxes. So um, looking at some of the things that are headed to the ballot, of course, so much depends upon its money for what, you know, uh, 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 and who's going to oppose it and how much money they're going to, what the arguments are going to be. Really, the only thing that we saw that had, as it has historically had very strong support, is uh, cigarette tax, which, you know, is something that hasn't been raised for a while, and it affects relatively few people. We've done focus groups um, around California in which um, We've even seen people who smoke say, raise my taxes. You know, I'm trying to quit. Help me out here, you know? <laughs> so, Force um, me into it. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, but we know that there's some very powerful interests that would be heard from. And well, it would be t depend upon what that money is going to go for. And it's also interesting to me, and, and, you know, this is like my request as a reporter, like, you know, I, I desperately want to, like, craft the poll for news. Yeah. Sorry, that's who I am. Um, but in the Prop 30 number, you know, there's been such a discussion about about what to do with Prop 30 taxes when they roll off, extend them, make them permanent. Mm -hmm. um, but part of that too is like, you know, when you ask the question, you have to ask the question about what Prop 30 is now. And a great part of that debate in Sacramento is do you rejigger the Prop 30 yeah. universe? We only have to roll back the clock to 2012 to remember that the polling seemed to indicate that when people were asked to tax the wealthy, mm -hmm. they were very much for that. The sales tax part of Prop 30 was the hardest sell. And so I will be very curious to see if a measure moves forward, yeah. if you're able to you know, suss out that difference between the income tax portion of something like that and the sales tax portion, which sales tax portion could make it less appealing right. in some ways. So, and, and me too. So uh, Prop 30 passed with, what's it, 54%? Something like that. Yeah. and. Um, I mean, it was almost a perfect storm type of situation in which uh, Prop 30 passed, um, and didn't pass by an over overwhelming amount, but it, but it certainly passed by a comfortable amount. And that was, uh, you know, a budget that was crafted that said uh, in that same year in 2012 that if this tax doesn't pass, right. schools are going to get less money, right? Um, that had no political impact whatsoever, right? Oh, <laughs> there's nothing that can have greater that, political impact that I can imagine. That was a joke, right. Webb. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. And you know, um, uh, and a, a governor who uh, who was an active spokesperson for it, and who said, you know, this is going to be a temporary tax. The temporary part of it was really important too. So, therein lies the um, the dilemma for the governor. Of course, is to say it's temporary, and then you know, say, well, it's going to be temporary for a little bit longer, or you know, how is that going to work? So, um, how this would work without the governor's support, you know, that's another question. I just want to ask you a couple of things too about the tax measures before we move on to a couple of the other ones in there, um, and that's about different parts of the electorate and, and how people feel about things. I mean, we spend a lot of time, I know you do, and I know we do in the in the news world, trying to talk about which Californians show up to vote, mm -hmm. uh, younger voters, older voters, younger Californians, older Californians, um, uh, different um, ethnicities. I mean, you know, trying to kind of break it all down. But when I look at the tax questions, unlike some of the social issues or other things where there are these like great chasms between yeah. generations, it's like younger Californians and older Californians all agree. I mean, they're, they're, they are imbued with that, you know, California skepticism. Yeah, isn't that interesting that um, we didn't see, if you look on the, the page uh, with the report with the, the, uh, the, the, the revenue questions, we didn't see big differences between likely voters and uh, all Californians in, in, in any of these cases. Um, and uh, again, uh, a lot of this comes down to how people feel about government, um, but it also comes down to the to the to the fact that um, um, across the economic spectrum and across the age group, um, 
going back to your earlier statement that uh, this is th there's not a lot of confidence and enthusiasm about the economy. There's a sense that what well, well, you know, wait a minute, you know, um, I'm not sure how this might affect me economically. Um, before we move off of um, of some of this, I just. I'm this guy that always calls Mark and talks about the um, contradictory California nature. And, you know, full disclosure, I didn't grow up in California. I guess after 23 years, I consider myself a Californian. Uh, my kids are Californians. But the contradictory nature of Californians. So in this poll, you ask them, do you think the state and local tax system is in need of major changes or minor changes? 54% mm -hmm. uh, of likely voters said major changes. Yeah. Then when you ask them about the most talked about major change out there, mm -hmm. the um, expanding sales taxes to services. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So in some ways, I'm always struck by this, uh, again, by this notion of, there's a lot of desire to do things until you get to the specifics. And you know, to be fair, you didn't ask them about other ideas that are out right. there. But that is really the biggest idea and the one being talked about in the Capitol a lot. And so there's this nature of we want something, but we don't know what it is in yeah. some ways. Yeah. And um, often what people say that they want when they say they want major changes in the tax system is at odds they with- They want less tax. <laughs> they want less tax. Uh, they want it to be simpler. And if you're describing a proposal like uh, how we're going to change the sales tax system, add, 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 the, um, uh, add services, reduce the rate overall, you've, you've probably lost uh, those people who are not you know, necessarily fiscal experts in this area. So um, often we find that, um, um, yeah, people want simplicity. They want um, certainty about their taxes, too, which is one of the things that's been very popular about Prop 13 over time, whatever complaints people have had about 13. It's the issue of the certainty, which, um, and the simplicity, the 1%, and the 1% of the sales price, the 2% per year, okay, we can understand that, you know. Um, so a couple of other things that you, you asked about in this poll that got a lot of media attention, um, out of the gate last night. Uh, let me ask about the marijuana question first. So, uh, record high for your polling. Uh, 50 no pun intended, right? Uh, right yeah. <laughs> and I thought I was the joke guy. Uh, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> record high, you should have put that in quote marks. Uh, record high, 54% of residents uh, in the poll favor legalizing marijuana, 44% opposed, as you say here pretty much tracks national numbers that you've seen, but that's high, that, that's an that's a elevated number, <laughs> I'm not saying high, for Californians. Um, what do you think that, I mean, you've been asking this question a little bit, and we also had a ballot measure a few years ago on the issue. Um, what do you take out of that? So we've been asking that question for about five years. The number has been trending up ever so slightly in every poll. Um, and uh, it's consistent with, with with what's going on in the national polls right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that I um, wanted to point out about this survey is that we're really not very different from the nation as a whole. 53% the national, latest national poll taken almost at the same time, 54% in California with a trend going, going up. So, uh, you know, one of the things that happens is that when um, other states or other countries um, legalize uh, something, that um, and the sky doesn't fall, and that's been the case now in, in uh, the state of Washington, the state of Colorado. That that to some degree begins to build support, and that is uh, one of the things that's going on. Um, most of the uh, well, of course, California has also had now a longer history with medical marijuana. Um, and so that also, you know, sets, sets the stage for, for the conversations uh, that are going on today. But by and large right now, we're hearing uh, mostly from the proponents and very little from the people who uh, would, would oppose um, legalizing marijuana. Um, important, one of the important findings um, in the last two surveys uh, to, to keep in mind is we ask a question about um, of, of people um, who are in our poll, 
have you ever smoked marijuana and have you smoked marijuana recently or was that a while ago and so forth. So the majority of Californians, some 55%, um, roughly the same numbers in both polls, say that uh, they've never smoked marijuana. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of those folks um, are opposed, but not all of them. But when you think about what has to happen here is that a number of people who haven't smoked marijuana and may never plan to smoke marijuana, mm. you know, have to be convinced next year that this is a law that is worth passing. This is one of those issues where there are differences in subsets. Yeah. Um, and I should point out, too, that, the, that, that your poll found 56% of likely voters, so slightly higher among likely right. voters, which, of course, is, yeah. um, is very key as the different groups are considering right. various right. forms of a 2016 ballot measure. Uh, but when you younger voters, much more willing to consider this, younger, uh, older voters not. But the number that caught my eye, Mark, 60% of Latinos yes. oppose the yeah. idea. Yeah. And I think it, we talk a lot about these, um, these demographic changes in California and the California electorate and who shows up for an election. <laughs> yes. And there is, a, there is a different, perhaps, conversation going on culturally. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just an interesting number that I don't know what we'll make of. Yeah, and I think it's a really interesting number, too. 60% of white non-Hispanics in favor, 60% of, uh, of, of Latinos Completely opposed opposite there, yeah. There. And we've been trying to uncover exactly where that is. We know that um, in, in this recent poll, we asked uh, whether the level of concern people had that if it became legalized, um, that it would, um, you know, basically, um, you know, encourage um, underage um, children, min minors to, to uh, to, to try marijuana. So there may be an issue around really that the, the, the younger demographics of Latinos, um, of the Latino population, it could also be an issue of um, a, a social conservatism that we, you know, we, we see a, 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 a reluctance, at least at first, to embrace a, uh, a change in what has been a social norm for a long time. And so we'll, but, you know, it's a, to me, that's an important finding, not just in terms of, well, you know, it, so it's 60% opposed, but, um, you know, that, um, that passes. But when you think of the overall size of the Latino population in California and the projections for what the size will be in the future, that's going to that's gonna be very, you know, I think that's just going to be very telling about is this, is this a change you want to make if there is strong resistance in a group that um, maybe not in the electorate, but in the population at large is going to be a very significant group. Well, and you made a great point that all we have heard so far really in the public narrative has been from people who support the idea. Mm -hmm. And we haven't heard really from opponents. And, and I got to tell you, I'm, there's going to be a no campaign of some way, shape, or form. And when that no campaign comes out, what, what groups do they target? Mm -hmm. And then what messages do they target? And to that point, your question where you ask about um, worried about the impact on underage people. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have um, you know, some concern out there. That could be a potential yeah. no argument. Mm -hmm. And then also, that resonates with Latinos, 63%. Right. Uh, versus 37% of whites say they are very concerned about the underage Californians and the impact. And so I kept feeling like, you know, you can see ways that a no yes. campaign could mount itself and present itself, because there is going to be one of some shape or form. And 87% and of the people who said that they opposed it in our poll mm -hmm. said that they were, were, were concerned about the, um, you know, what impact um, uh, legalization would have on underage, um, on children and minors using marijuana so um, a couple of other things before we get to that magic question moment and in this it's 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 virtually impossible to talk about an entire poll in X number of minutes but you know uh, we need the slides where's the <laughs> new dad um, um, but what I was going to say is um, so you talk uh, just quickly I want to mention that you've got these voter turnout questions you yeah. asked um, people seem very supportive of these ideas to boost voter turnout which has been <clears throat> awfully anemic yeah um, over the last uh, couple of election cycles. Uh, in some ways, I'm not surprised by them. I mean, I kind of almost see those as motherhood, kind of like, you know, mom and apple pie. Like, it's really hard to say no yeah. to those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is there any, was there any surprise out of that to you? I mean... Well, we, th there were a couple of things about the questions we asked on, on voter turnout. I was 
interested in finding out if if um, people, the general public, felt that the voter turnout, um, it, it specifically the low voter turnout we've had in California recently, with how many saw that as a big problem, and a very sizable proportion say it's 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 a big problem. Two thirds of likely voters. Two thirds of likely voters. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also interested among those who are not registered today, how many feel that's a big problem? Mm -hmm. And that was just slightly under 50%. So not as high as for, for likely voters. Um, raising some questions about motivational issues in, uh, among the, the un, un, unregistered voters. Uh, then we asked a couple of questions about um, things that are being considered to be imported from uh, Oregon's um, election system. One in particular, the automatic registration through the DMV, which is winding its way through the legislature right now. The Secretary of House State. House of Origin this week, yes. Secretary of State's a big proponent of it. Uh, very strong support in our poll, support among the unregistered as well as the registered. So, And then um, the, the other, so that was the issue in terms of making registration easier. The issue of making voting easier to us is seems to be, um, you know, a, at least as important as the ease of, of, of registration is is making voting easier. And we asked in this case about going to a mail ballot uh, system where everybody would get a, a, ba a, ma a ballot mailed to them, and and that also received um, strong support. But I, I encourage you in the last two polls, John, to look at um, our open-ended questions about of the people who aren't registered, why they're not registered, mm -hmm. of the people who are uh, registered, why they're not voting. And there you see there are all sorts of motivational and trust and confidence and, and um, knowledge and interest and, 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 and purely lifestyle issues. Um, so I don't, I mean, I don't want us to think that we're going to solve these, uh, our voter turnout issues simply by um, making it easier to vote or making it easier for people to register to vote. Yeah. Well, that's actually a good point because, because the 30, they're 30 percent of the registered, of the registered adults, 30 percent said they don't have enough time. Yeah. And when you talk to registrars about how they actually get the people who are registered to vote. Yeah. You hear lots of ideas that are that are circulating out there. Uh, Dean Logan, the registrar of Los Angeles County, has been talking about you know can I make it easier to get people to cast their ballot or places where they can you know again not having enough time and that's a mechanics issue, not yeah. just about registering people. Yeah. So it's a, I mean, I think yeah. a good point. Yeah, yeah. So you know, undoubtedly, we'll see more people voting next year than um, we did um, last year. Undoubtedly, because we have a presidential election. Um, and that's just yeah, you know, that's just the nature of things. So we have till 2018 to really figure out some things that we can do, some concrete things that we can do beyond making it easier for people to register to vote. Um, um, uh, to how we're going to deal with what has been a long-term trend, you know, that uh, of 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 fewer people voting in. California elections. So that would be the normal place to ask you for questions, but there is one question I left off of this, which got a lot of news attention, and maybe I've left it at the end because I have my own like relative mm -hmm. reaction to it. It's the vaccinations question, where you because it's been talked about a lot in the legislature and the personal belief exemption uh, in California, uh, scaling it back, doing away with it, depending on the way that the, the uh, piece of legislation has looked. So in the poll, you found that two-thirds of Californians surveyed, 67 percent, say children should not be allowed to attend school unless they are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And then there were questions about vaccines being safe. There was a majority saying they were safe. I guess my observation is because this question has never been asked, there's really no yeah. benchmark to know what to do with the number, right? right. Is that a high number? Is it, would it have been higher before the debate? You know, so that was kind of like my, my, my quick thing was like, well, I don't know what to compare it to. But you have to start somewhere. And it's an interesting, it's in, it's in the public domain. People are talking about it. So um, how we approach these things, um, we look to see if there are any national, if we don't have time trends, um, we look to see if there are any national questions. In this case, there were national questions that were asked in a CBS News poll in February. So. Um, that weren't exactly what's being discussed now, but at least give us a sense of, you know, what's going on in California 
um, does that result in people feeling differently about this issue than people nationally? Mm -hmm. And the results were very, very close to the national uh, findings, uh, both for the safety of vaccination and the need for vaccinations to, um, um, for, for children to uh, attend uh, public school. And it, it just to give you a window into uh, how PPIC views its uh, work in, um, in the Capitol, um, you know, we, we want to, when possible, when there's, when there's a debate and a discussion out there that's very controversial, that's high profile, you know, we, we want to be able to reflect the voices of all the people, not to negate the fact that it's important to, to, to protest and that people should protest. And, and often people will raise awareness about issues that, that, that weren't, weren't discovered before about protests. But we wanted to give a sense of, okay, Right now, how does the average Californian feel about these issues? Pretty similar to the, the average American that, you know, this is, this is how we should handle vaccinations and this is how we feel about the safety of them. And there was also, you know, here and there in anecdotal reports, the notion that, oh, you know, that's coming from this sector or, or, or the other of the state, the region, you know, the economic sector. In our polling, we found that it was more of the, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, that there were some differences around um, uh, support for vaccinations and feelings about safety, uh, but maybe not the way that people had seen them. And with that, I see folks with microphones. That's always a good sign. So <laughs> if you've got your questions for, for Mark about the poll. We'll... Uh, or John. I, I got nothing question. to tell you. I got nothing good to tell you other than like, I like reading polls. It's like <laughs> actually one of my favorite times when a new poll comes in and we can kind of get the sense of what Californians are thinking and, and why. Um, and let's see, if you've got a question, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep uh, giving him the field and uh, ideas here. Um, so let me ask a question then. Um, what, what um, when you look at, at, at the vaccination question too, mm -hmm. uh, there's also a reflection of some of these communities, um, the different communities in California feeling different ways. The, I mean, there's a number in here that says, um, when you ask about, are vaccines very safe? Right. Uh, the white Californians polled 65% say yes. The Latino Californians polled only 49% 49, yeah. say yes. And again, these differences in communities across California, yeah. uh, this issue and other issues and how things play out. Yeah. Uh, knowledge, information, connection to information sources, uh, connection to, to, uh, to health information sources. Um, we saw differences both by race and ethnicity um, and by, uh, by education, suggesting that, um, you know, uh, we need to do a better job in terms of, of informing the diverse populations in California when, when um, there are controversial issues like this. Um, there's a question up here. If you want to hold on, we got the microphone so everybody at home can hear you. So you got something really cool to say, you know. This is your Oprah moment. <laughs> Don't blow this. Um, <laughs> So there's two options or, or two suggestions or, or things that have been proposed. Yeah, a little closer to your mouth. Yeah, oh, there you go. Is this better? Yeah, you're good. Okay, so there's two um, proposals to, to um, better turnout for, for voters. Um, which ones, is there a list of some that didn't make the list? Um, you mentioned that we're gonna have to come up with more ideas to, to do this. Is there anything out there now? Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ideas about um, what we need to do. They, it, all, it all requires more money, um, you know, in terms of, of actual, you know, door-to-door -door efforts to increase uh, voter registration or, uh, and uh, to uh, efforts that start in schools um, in which you're actually involving, you know, high schools uh, more in, um, encouraging people when they're beginning to get to the age. So, you know, I, I think that there are many ideas that are being discussed by the Secretary of State and the Chief Justice who have really taken leadership. So civic education, you know, improving civic education in California so people understand why it's important to vote. 
and why it's important to be registered. Um, so they, they, they all take money and effort. It, and I was going to say, and there are small ideas and big ideas yeah. out there. I mean, some of the things you've seen out of the Capitol, um, smaller ideas. I mean, this, this bill about, um, about everybody who registers at DMV that is eligible to vote would, get, would be automatically registered is one way. And that's a pretty big one, I think, in some ways. It's not big in terms of actually maybe getting people to vote because you can give them a ballot, but are they going to cast it? But it is big in terms of the mechanics because DMV has not had the best record in the world of registering people to vote under the Motor Voter Act that's existed for 20 years. But there have been smaller ones like saying um, you turn in a ballot and as long as you turn it in on time or as long as you mailed it on time, even if it doesn't arrive, it gets counted because there are still now pretty strict rules about when they're counted. But then there are very big ones that are big societal issues about why do we vote on Tuesdays? Right. Why don't we vote online? I don't want to start that one. That's another whole discussion. But um, I mean, I find it interesting. There's more discussion about it now yeah. and maybe in part prompted by the historically painfully low yeah. uh, voter turnout of the 2014 cycle. Yeah. So. I, I, yeah. We'll see. Hope springs eternal. Yes. Yes. Well, this isn't my question, but I have to comment on the, on the okay. turnout idea. Um, this is an even bigger idea than, than you were talking about, John, but um, not something we should discuss now. But I just want to put it out there that, that um, I think one of the big ideas we need to look at and answer those voters who say, my vote doesn't matter, my vote doesn't count. Mm -hmm. I think those voters are looking for a much bigger idea about representation, mm -hmm. about how they can get represented, not based on where they live, but how they think. And right now, all of our districts are either red or blue. And if you don't fit, you don't get represented. So I think that's a big idea. The whole structure of our electoral system should be looked at. But that's not real popular among electeds or political consultants or the political machine, and not very known among the public. Mm -hmm. So my question really is about uh, the uh, Prop 13 tax. Mm -hmm. What do you think the chance of the uh, commercial property tax, uh, you know, based on the market value being, uh, what do you think about that on the ballot? Do you think it could pass? Well, um, first thing first, the number dropped from the last time you asked the number question. Number dropped, yeah, mm -hmm. to, fi to 50%, right? So 50% is not where most political consultants would say is the place you'd want to start a campaign when you even haven't had the kind of powerful interests that are likely to, um, uh, well, have not just likely, they've said, you know, if this happens, we're going to be out there um, and we're going to try to defeat this. So. Just keeping in mind the fact that most initiatives fail, because if you're a voter, even if you like the idea of split roll, um, maybe there's something wrong, you, you know, that will be pointed out that's wrong about this particular version of this effort to change it. Um, that's why legislative measures, despite whatever we think about the legislature, if it's gone through the legislature and it appears on the ballot, you know, there's a very strong chance it's going to be passed. If, if it's in an initiative, somebody will spend money to, to raise questions, and it doesn't take much to raise questions, and we're starting at 50%. I think one of the great things from my observation as a reporter is, uh, yes, the numbers aren't great, and, and, and I think the problem is, and, and you, you use the term Prop 13, but Prop 13 would become the campaign. Yeah. in a lot of ways. I mean, for better or for worse, it would become a referendum on the, on the history, on the track record of Prop 13. But the, but the fascinating thing to me is two things. One, who the electorate is. So which electorate shows up in 2016 if you're going to put it on the 2016 ballot. Um, and, as a, as a, as a, and then the second part is what else is on the ballot mm -hmm. to either compete for attention or interest or political money. This is going to be the easiest um, it has been in a generation to get an initiative on the ballot because of that abysmal low voter turnout in 2014. You all know this, right? Like I'm people who nod this, right? You know, the, the, the qualification threshold for an initiative is based on how many people voted in the race for governor. Nobody voted in the race for governor except for Neil Kashkari and Sutter Brown <laughs> and all of us. Um, and so it's very easy to get an initiative on the ballot. So we could have a flood of initiatives that actually could get on the ballot. I mean, it, now it would cost only about a million bucks, most people believe, to get the signatures to get it on. So getting it on the ballot is different than actually waging a campaign successfully. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what else gets on the ballot? Uh, and what draws money? Just today, as we're sitting here talking, um, Chuck Reed, the former mayor of San Jose, 
introduced his new pension mm -hmm. initiative, which would basically um, make it very difficult to have traditional pensions moving forward for new state and local government workers. It's complicated, but that's a very shorthand. Anyway, um, would that attract money away from a campaign like that? Would organized labor have to fight that and not have the money to put behind the split role? I mean, these are all the chess moves of politics. Um, and you know what Mark has found is like you know pretty lousy numbers if you're a political consultant to start off with it. And yet that yearning is there year after year of people who believe Prop 13 is not working the way that even Howard Jarvis sold it all those years ago. But it'd be fun to watch. I personally want them all in the ballot. Because <laughs> it's full employment for political reporters. But anyway. <laughs> oh. Hmm? Um, You're going to ask about the budget, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to ask about marijuana. I knew okay. it. I know that. Um, so as we've discussed, as, as you guys indicated, that, that for, for the most part right now, you make the claim that we've only heard from proponents. I would, I would argue that we aren't just hearing from proponents. With okay. two years now, with the League of California Cities and the California mm. Police Chiefs having sponsored bills, mm. done a bit about sponsored bills. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Shout out. Yeah, nice. Um, and, and then also, of course, we, we've got um, substantial conversations from, um, and some of these are perhaps scare stories that were just referred to um, on the floor mm -hmm. um, of the assembly um, while we were speaking. AB 266 has passed and moved forward. SB 643 has passed. Mm -hmm. You know, the, um, the question ongoing, I think we've talked about this before, is in general, do you think the use of marijuana should be legal? comma, or not. Mm -hmm. That's, of course, not going to be the campaign. It's right. going to be about taxation. It's going to yeah. be about regulation. It's right. going to be about um, moving forward, using the models that have successfully been adopted by other yeah. states. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would see that this perhaps should not be looked at as the baseline for support. Okay. And that the baseline for support, obviously, um, uh, there were some polls that were released by um, uh, David Binder working for UFCW mm -hmm. um, that had um, some different top lines that, that were already disclosed this spring. So in general, um, but that's also like every every sure. poll is about how you ask the question, though, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, in so general, I, just... I, I would make the argument that that proponents, on the other hand, haven't really been speaking mm. about some of some of the merits necessarily, okay. and absent either of those two considerations, we yeah. did see with Prop Forty Seven last year substantial support on the part yeah. of voters for criminal justice reforms, right. and there wasn't a big no campaign that showed yeah. up to any sort of effective use. And some of those likely suspects that were opposed to Prop 47, I would argue, are also going to be opposed to cannabis legalization. So let's look and see how effective they are, you know, a year and a half from now. Anyway, okay. Well, so that, I don't know that, whether there were questions good. or comments or a uh, lot both, of both. And, and useful, and, and also, you know, uh, I think a message to me: look around and, and hear both. You know, here we're hearing from from uh, both sides at this point. I just want to make a, a comment about um, questions. So, um, so using questions that I can compare to national polls, very important. Trends over time, very important. When we get into the election cycle, like the last time there was a uh, marijuana initiative on the ballot, we will, when there's a ballot uh, title and label, we will ask that. Um, before there is, it's hardly ever the case and, and you know there was a uh, comment really it's not just about marijuana it was related to, to the prop 13 questions joel fox mentioned today difference between the business roundtable survey and ours on prop 13. we're not going to get into the specifics because we don't know what the specifics are going to be yet right so we're not going to be like the um and i know david's work and his, his work is very good we're just not going to be in that testing those different levels of detail. Uh, but, but next year, if it's on the ballot, as soon as there is a, a ballot title and label, and if it has revenues in it or whatever it has in it, um, that's what we're going to have. It would that's just seem like ask. to me, though, But too, we'll also continue to ask that general question. It would just seem like to me, too, though, if I, if, if I could. I mean, the challenge is, is that there are multiple versions out there right now. Yeah. And, 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 and no one has quite settled on exactly what it's going to look like. The lieutenant governor has become this person who's doing this listening tour around the state. Uh, I actually think as a reporter, I think where Gavin Newsom lands on this is going to be a very big moment for everybody, both proponents and opponents of something like this, because he's going to become instantly the most visible person who has weighed in on it. Mm -hmm. And if he finds one he likes, that could be a big help. If he walks away, that's a big hindrance. 
Um, but I mean, I just think that, you know, with so many measures out there floating around, it's very hard to know which one of those themes. And, and so like, to your point, uh, Sean, I think it'd be great to test, you know, what works, but also what would be the negatives to it? You know, what are going to be the, you know, and that's what the campaigns are going to do. They're going to run the polls, they're going to test what the downside part of this is. Um, it's going to be a really interesting discussion, I think. And I think too, you know, to your point about every, you know, to the snapshot in time where we began this discussion, um, the polling of the last measure um, was interesting, and but then it then it became about that measure in particular, and that measure sank in large part because of the way the measure was crafted, yeah. which is why so many people are being so thoughtful about the way this measure is crafted. But uh, it's going to be a fun campaign to watch, and I and I still just believe whatever else is on the ballot is going to be fascinating to see how it impacts you know, who turns out who that electorate is. It'll be fun. So I'm going to ask John Myers a question uh, uh, specifically about this. So, you know, we've, yes got, the, no. we've got the new um, SB 1253, which will, uh, which has a role for the legislature in um, reviewing initiatives. Um, do you think the, le the legislature will weigh in a, in a way on, you, you mentioned Gavin Newsom. Will the legislature choose this as an issue to weigh in on? I I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. I mean, I really <laughs> like, and I, I think all of you know. I mean, this is the this is the law the governor signed that says after you've uh, collected 25 percent of the signatures needed for um, for getting it on the ballot, the legislature has to hold hearings. Mm -hmm. I would point out that I think the law is written in a very fascinating, vague way as to what the legislature actually has to do. Does the legislature just say, okay, this is the measure, thanks, goodbye? Or do they engage in a way and, and, and really wrestle with it? Uh, I, I don't know, because I think that about a few other measures too. I've even thought that a really smart um, group could go finance gathering just enough signatures to force the legislature to have a discussion about something. Because I mean, again, it's all about the mechanics of you know, how low that threshold is. But I, I, I do think it'll be interesting to watch. And I think to the point here, I think there has been a demonstrable change in the conversation over the last few mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, and it, this is like throwing like a really big bomb at the end of a conversation, but I said this to you on the phone, and I'm just going to own it here for whoever the heck is watching it. Um, in some ways, I, I find it fascinating with the way we changed the discussion in California nationally about same-sex marriage. Yeah. We had a cultural shift, a change, and maybe we're having a cultural change yeah. about, uh, about legalization of marijuana. And the numbers seem to kind of reflect to me some kind of rethinking of where the old viewpoint was. That's not to say the two, measures, two, two uh, subjects have anything in common, mm -hmm. except that they had a historical position that has shifted maybe to a new position. And, and the cultural change goes beyond California to, it, it, it shows up in the national polls and it's related to what's going on in other states and other, yeah. other places in the world. Yeah. It's a somewhat far-fetched idea. Should this be our... Uh, underline that oh, cultural just, change took place what? in the state of Washington on both... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That cultural change took place in the state of Washington in one election on both issues, mm -hmm. and it was both by public vote. Mm -hmm. It was popular vote that yeah. brought both in it, it, at once. Yeah. And I, I grew up there. I still wonder what is what goes on in Washington that we are mm -hmm. that much more liberal than a, a mm -hmm. state like California. Mm -hmm. But part of what I think is it's, this is an even more diverse state. Yeah. And the more, you know, and the people there just got to agree easier because mm -hmm. they aren't that different. But I, I will say too that I think, and maybe this is just the only other thing I should say on it, is that I do think both issues, and again, it's very tenuous to make this connection. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not writing the story tomorrow because I don't think I've got more than me just kind of humming about it. But I do think it's instructive as to how political campaigns are different than the issue as a singular thing. Mm -hmm. Because even look back to 2008 and the same-sex marriage m measure, the political campaign became a lot of other things and not just the question as a concept. And the legalization of the marijuana campaign before wasn't just the concept anymore. It became a different political animal. And so in the, you know, in the context of politics, yeah. these numbers, these questions can all shift, which will be fun to watch in 2016 when you get to sample all of these things again. That sounds like the right ending, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, see, I knew it. I had a good universal nodding. Thanks, Mark, and thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.